All right, hello everyone. Another day, another Try Hack Me video walkthrough. So today we are going to hack another famous Try Hack Me machine, Volumversity. It's a very interesting box. It has a both. Uh, uh, it has a very interesting initial foothold and privilege escalation. It's one of the classics, we could say, machines in TriHackMe, and uh, it's a really good box to play for beginners. So without further ado, let's hack this machine. So once more, we are going to treat this as a black box pen testing. This means that we're not going to take a sneak peek into any of the answers in the room because they might hint us uh, towards the path we'll have to take to hack this and we definitely don't want that. Okay. Okay, so we've pinged our machine, everything is up and running and the first thing that we'll want to do is run an Nmap scan here. Okay, we're going to run the most popular ports uh, scan and we can see some ports here, some open ports. Now we will also want to run, um, all right, yeah, I'm probably we type that too fast. We already want to scan a full Enma port scan. Now this might take a while. Uh, this might reveal something interesting or uh, something completely uninteresting. It might not complete at all, but it's always a good choice to run this. Um, so let's get up here to this pane the initial pain. All right, we can see that so far everything we have discovered is here. We can also see one other port, so it's probably a good idea to let it finish. Okay, it's finished. It has discovered one more port, 3333. So we can now launch a full scan to this machine and enumerate pretty much every port that we have found. Okay, we're going to save the output to a text file so that we can further investigate it later on. And let's run this scan. Let's close this pane and let's open okay let's open our sublime text editor that will allow us to take a look uh, at some interesting things that we have found here okay so let's delete those files there are files from the box that are previously uh, hacked. Uh, we can keep limp piece. Okay, we'll need it. So let's keep it right here. And let's see what we have here. So the Nmap scan is completed um, pretty fast, actually. So let's head right there. We can see we have an FTP server uh, we can see the version of the server, we can search for vulnerabilities. Um, for example, we can use searchploit. And as we've seen in another box, simple CDF, this version is vulnerable to a remote denial of service. It's actually not much use to us right now because we want to root this box, we don't want to bring it down. We can see we, we can establish an SSH connection provided we have the right credentials. You can also search for vulnerabilities of this specific version, but SSH exploits are not that common in CDF scenarios or in real life ones. I mean, the 
uh, the target must use a really outdated SSH um, service. Uh, we can see that we have port uh, 445. Okay, that's interesting. So let's use enum for Linux dash A and I'm sorry, the IP address here, it will run some interesting scans around. Okay. And we can also use SMB map. Let's define the host. Well, let's try to recursively uh, browse any available file shares. Okay, and at the same time, we can use another tool, SMB client, with a dash L flag. Going to play some hashes here. Okay, let's see. We don't have a password right now, but we can see that it has printed the same shares here. It has also printed the workgroup, uh, but we can see that as a guess, we don't have any actual access, all right, to either print or IPC. So my guess for now is that we should probably wait until we find some valid credentials and uh, try to further uh, peek into these file shares. Okay, so let's see what else we have here. Now, we have two interesting ports open related to uh, the HTTP protocol. Okay, we have port 3128 and 3333. We can see that it is squid proxy here. Another interesting thing that we can search for vulnerabilities. Okay, so let's just do that. Let's search exploit this one or perhaps just squid. And we can see, see, we actually see a bunch of possible exploits here. Now our version is 3.5.12 and 3.5.12, we can see that, all right, this might work. Uh, we can see various interesting things here. Okay, so anything older than 3, 5.12 is not going to work, of course, uh, but, well, we could keep that in our mind and do some more research later. But actually, what we can do is try and get in here in port 3128. Okay, it says following error was encountered. We have an invalid URL. Okay. Now let's see if that's a problem here. Now, again, we have a problem, but we can see here that it's vulnerability. So that's probably the name of the server that we use. Okay. Let's activate our foxy proxy let's reload that and we have captured that right here okay uh, now let's add this to our context a new context actually and let's try to spider it in case it finds something okay just try to fetch a robots.txt uh, no luck here. Yeah. Mm. Go to webmaster. Okay, same thing for sitemap. Let's see if. Okay, yeah. Uh, so from Vulnerversity, as we mentioned before, that's actually the name of the server. Okay. Uh, Good. Now I don't see anything else of interest here. Leaked version 
yes, we've searched for possible exploits of this version. 3.5.12. Okay. It seems that there's not much of interest right here. Let's see if the other HTTP port here, 3333, is of use to us. Okay, so let's open another tab. And, all right, Vol University. Hmm, that sounds interesting. So, it might be university focused on studying vulnerabilities, perhaps, I don't know. Okay, so we have a nice site here. Um, we can see some stuff. Let's see. Now, as you can notice in the lower, in the lower uh, left part of our screen, these uh, buttons here are for demonstrative reasons, all right? They, they won't lead us anywhere, okay? So, actually, let's, uh, yeah, so actually let's search a bit around the site, see if we can find anything. We have possible usernames here. We could have possible usernames, but they're all the same, so that hints us that it's just a decorative input here. Now, this won't lead us anywhere. Okay. Uh, okay, after a little pause, uh, we return to the enumeration of this website. We don't see anything of interest here. Okay, now there could be something interesting here in admin, but still the blog posts are for purely demonstrative reasons. Um, and yeah, we can see that it doesn't take us anywhere. Now let's add this to our context as well. Okay, let's delete those things to clear a bit our workspace. And right now let's try to spider this. And since this is an actual website it might reveal something interesting it might not okay so while it does its magic another thing that we'll definitely want to do is okay maybe try and see some technologies here okay we have a bunch of interesting technologies but not something of interest for example not a content management system uh, so right now we will have to do some further web application enumeration now we can utilize nikto all right we can utilize nikto and let it scan this website it might find something interesting although it might take a bit longer before the scan completes and another thing that we definitely want to do is some um, directory brute forcing so we're going to use our tool here uh, go buster we are going to deploy this wood list right here and we're gonna let it run. Okay, I just found something. Images, CSS. All right, that might take a bit to complete. Okay, new CGI's directory is found. Yep, this version is outdated, but I don't think that it will help us to find an exploit to get us in the system. Okay, so let's check whether something was found here or not. Okay, robots is not available. Teacher single not available. Well, pretty much nothing. Okay, let's let's try to 
spider it a bit more. And this time we'll use Ajax spiders. Okay, we can close this one. Let's see our alert. We see a vulnerable JavaScript library. Okay, bootstrap. No, I don't think that this will help us. Um, okay. Let's see if we have any more suspicious comments here. Uh, no, nothing here. So pretty much we have nothing so far. Let's check. Go Buster. Hmm. It has found an interesting directory, right? Internal. That's something worth checking so let's paste that here and see if it takes us somewhere hmm, cool all right we have an upload form now that's interesting that's actually quite interesting okay uh, nice so that's an upload form uh, let's see if we can upload virus style, for example. Let's see if we can upload a picture. Click Submit. Extension not allowed. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, let's try to upload uh, an empty node.txt file. Perhaps it will allow us to upload this. Okay, let's go to our <laughs> uh, folder here. Volversity, no dot txt. All right, let's check this out. Extension not allowed again. Well, now this this is a bit strange. Okay, so um, okay, so now that's a bit strange. I mean, we've tried to upload some some common files, all right, uh, but nothing seems to be allowed. Th this might be a rabbit hole or um, this could actually work. We can see here that we have an index.php, so probably it runs PHP and it would be a good idea. Yeah, it runs PHP, definitely. So that is a nice clue that we should uh, upload something close to a PHP reverse shell to get access to the system. Okay, so let's, all right, let's stop here and let's try to locate a PHP reverse shell. Okay, let's copy that here. Let's rename it to something smaller and let's modify it. I'm going to delete all those comments. Doesn't matter if you don't, but I want to see the information as clearly as I can. Okay, let's save that and let's try to upload the PHP file directly. All right, again, <laughs> we failed. So let's see what error it throws here. Okay, that's a push request. All right, so it says extension not allowed, the same as here. And uh, right now we could try various things. Okay, so we can try to possibly use double extensions, for example, .php, um, .jpg, or we could use something like .php5, or we could use .php with uh, the P's or the H being capital. We can try a lot of things, but the problem here, the fundamental problem is that we still don't know what kind of files are being allowed here. Okay, so, First, we have to determine this, okay? So what we are going to do is 
disable our Foxy proxy here and search for file extension word list in GitHub. Okay, so let's see that. Okay, that's a nice word list. I use it many of the times that I want to fuzz something. So right here, we, we want to try and fuzz the file extension with all possible PHP related um, extensions in order to see if something similar can be actually uploaded to the server. Okay, so what we are going to do here is take this request here, this post request, and open it to a request editor. <coughs> now, here you can see that we have a no.txt here. We're going to highlight it and fuzz it. Okay, so we are going to run the Zaproxy fuzzer in the extension. We have um, chosen our fuzz position and now we are going to defy our payload. So we're going to try various strings, right? You can fuzz uh, different uh, things, file, uh, JSON numbers, right? But here, since we have a custom word list, we are going to create it. So let's go here and grab all the PHP related extensions. Okay, let's paste them here. Let's see if we can get something else. This PHAR sounds interesting. Now, definitely we'll want to grab this. All right. So let's add PHAR. Okay, why not? This as well. And yeah, we can grab these down here. They are very interesting. Now, of course, we could download the list and chirrep it and filter the PHP related entries. But since this is a very small word list, um, we will do it manually. OK, so great. We've added all possible commonly used PHP related file extensions. Let's add our word list, let's click OK, and let's start our fuzzer. OK, so our fuzzer here has finished. And we can see that, um, yeah, it has tried all the payloads. So how are we going to determine if something was allowed or not? Well. A good idea uh, is to check by the response size, okay, the response size body, because we can see that in most of the cases it's extension not allowed. For example, this one is uh, 546 bytes, extension not allowed, the same here and here. So if we find a different um, size response of the body of our post request, then it might mean that something was actually uploaded. So if we filter it, we can see that we have all kinds of 546 lengths, sizes, sorry, uh, but we have something that stands out, all right? It's 532. And we can see here that it's a success, okay? So cool, it was successfully uploaded and it is a PHTML file, all right? So that's something that actually it can be launched in most of the cases as a PHP application file. Uh, so what we are going to do now is go here and see if that one was actually uploaded, okay? So we have an upload page, okay? Probably we'll be able to access this file somewhere. Now, as you remember, uh, we kind of uh, stopped our GoBuster here. It would 
probably have picked something like uploads, but since the hue is towards the end of the list, we stopped it too soon. But if we try and copy that, okay. Now, since this is the upload form, we could probably try something, all right, uploads here. No, it's not possible. Okay, or we could try, some, try something like eternal uploads. Oh, and we can see that right here, our file was uploaded. Okay, so our no PHTML file that was created from the fuzzer was uploaded. Of course, it doesn't contain anything, but right now we will upload our reverse shell and we'll try to launch it. All right, after a short pause, let's go and exploit it. So we have our shell.php. Now we'll need to rename it in shell.php.html because that's what's allowed to be uploaded in the site. And next thing is to run a Pongcat reverse uh, a Pongcat listener in port 4444. Okay, let's allow it to run for a bit. Okay, great. And right now we'll try to upload our file. Success, great stuff. Okay, so our payload, our reversal has been successfully uploaded. And let's get in here and reverse the page and we can see that it's here. Okay, sorry for another yet pause, but we're about ready to exploit our box. So we have our shell.phtml, we have our Pongcat listener setup. So let's try to access this file. Now the infinite loading is always a good sign that things are working out well for us. And if we see here, we have established a connection to our target. So if we list our sessions, we can see that we have an active session um, as a www.data user here. So if we uh, type back, we will arrive here. Okay. Let's clear our screen. Our connection is a bit slow. Okay, that's that's a downside of Pongcat. Sometimes uh, it's a bit slower than the original Netcat uh, listener. Okay, so let's do some basic enumeration. We can see user Bill here. Um, let's see. Okay, so can we access Bill's home folder? Indeed we can. All right. Good, so we can also read the user.txt file, but as I mentioned before, we're not doing it in a CDF style. We're, we'll rather do it in a black, as a black box pen test. Now, something else interesting here is that Nikto has also pick this internal directory. So even if we hadn't launched our uh, GoBuster uh, brute forcing uh, or GoBuster didn't pick this up, so Nikto would actually have picked that up. And that's why it's always a good idea to run um, various tools for the same reason, to cross-reference results and make sure you didn't miss anything. But enough of that, let's launch our favorite tool, Metasploit. Now, it might take a bit to load. We're going to let it load here. And in the meantime, we can see some interesting things that Enum for Linux has picked for us, okay? That's a great tool if you want to enumerate SMB servers, um, Windows environments, or even Linux ones. We can see that it has gathered some uh, interesting uh, NVT stat information. 
Okay, um, it could not get some information about our operating system, but we can see that it has also um, listed the available shares, although it was not able to have any access to them, as we can see here. And that is also interesting, all right? We have some password information. I don't know if that's accurate, but in Windows environment, it's always a great idea to have a look at this, okay? Because it might give you valuable information on the lockout policy, on the length of password, on the policy of password. So if you're into password cracking, that's definitely great information that you want to deploy. Okay, we can see that it has a minimum password length of five, which is actually a very short length. Uh, we can see that it has picked user bill here, okay? It has picked some uh, groups. Again, I don't know if that's accurate, but uh, you know, NNUM for Linux is a great tool. So if you find any uh, SMB shares, you definitely launch uh, this tool to gather some great information. But right now, uh, it seems that this information is not relevant to us. So let's get here. Now, the reason I opened Metasploit is because I want to gain a, meta a Metaprinter shell. So let's do this via web delivery. Of course, I could have launched a listener in Metasploit and I could have caught the initial reverse shell here, but I, I prefer to do it with Pongcat, do some basic enumeration there and then try to migrate into a interpreter session. So we're going to use the web delivery script. Uh, let's set the right options here. So the SRV host to our TriHackMe IP address, set L host to the same address again. And let's set the L port to the four or five since the four fours are already being used by Punkat. Okay, now another thing that we'll want to do is to see if it runs Python and which version. Okay, we can see it runs Python version 3.5.2. So uh, our, our Python target is valid. Okay, let's run it. It has, started, it has started a listener here. And right now we can grab this. Okay. Let's paste it here, and we have added three here, just to make sure that the right Python version will be executed. Okay, I think we pressed the wrong button. Okay, so if we paste it here and execute it, okay, we still have our initial cell. And right now, we are sending our stage, and soon, Metasploit will catch okay, this, uh, um, uh, the, the stage back, and we'll gain a interpreter shell, hopefully, here. Okay, but next I want to show you some neat tricks that Punkat can do. Okay, so we are here. Um, perhaps we want to launch some enumeration here, okay? Uh, we can do some manual stuff, but let's get to TMP and, you know, let's utilize an automation tool this time to do our enumeration, okay? So we can see that uh, this, this place, uh, yeah, it's, it's writable. So we can upload files here and write them. Okay, so we continue. Um, as I told you before, we're going to use an automation tool and we'll see the cool feature of Punkat. Uh, and this is that if we press CTRL and D, we can get back to our uh, local uh, Punkat instance. Okay, so here we can 
type some interesting commands, all right? So we, we can open another listener and let it wait in the background to catch perhaps another elevated shell. Uh, we could change uh, our local uh, directory. We could try to uh, attempt privilege escalation and we're going to try that in a minute. Okay, we can um, shift through various sessions. We can upload or download files. So what we're going to do here is to try and upload Limpies. Okay, let's see if that works. Okay, so it was uploaded. That's why, as I've mentioned in another video walkthrough, Pongcat is um, like the traditional Netcat, but in a more C2, uh, and it, C2 stands for Command and Control Framework. So it allows you various actions on the target that you can do with a simple Netcat listener. For example, with Netcat, we'd have to open, uh, I don't know, an FTP or a Python server in our machine and try to curl or wget this file to the target machine. But here we can do this with just one command, which is pretty cool. Okay, so let's get back to our session. Let's see here. Okay, let's change link piece to be executable. Let's clear it and let's run it. Okay, so while it runs, let's get back to our Metasploit. So here we can see that we have um, an open session. Okay, let's check our sessions. All right, so let's see if it works properly. UID. All right, we have an interpreter session. Great, let's background it and let's try to upgrade it to match our operating system. And the reason I'm doing it is because we want to search for possible kernel exploits, all right, and try to root this box this way. So we can see that, uh, yeah, probably Limpies will pick something up, but we should always try to go for easy wins, such as uh, kernel exploits. Okay, so I'm going to kill the first session that I opened. We have closed it, all right. And let's get to the local suggester module. Okay, let's use this one. Set session three and let's run it. Okay, so until it runs, until it finishes running, let's get back to our Ponca shell and see if it has found anything interesting. Okay. Which not found here. Okay, let's get to the top. And okay, well, something caught my eye here. Okay, I, I was going to run straight to the top, but I found something interesting here. Okay, that's a yellow, that's a huge red flag, 95%, that's a privilege escalation vector. So here we can see bin dash system CDL. Okay, now what we can do with this is copy this go to GTFO bins 
and search for this binary all right so we have system CDL here okay and our link piece script says that this one has an SUID set so we can see here that this is owned by root but it has the SID uh, the SUID set right here so this means that whoever runs whoever runs this service will run it with the root privileges and that's sometimes it can be abused as we can see here okay so we can go straight to the SUID exploitation paragraph and we can see the method here so it actually creates a file named service okay and then it links it here and it tries to enable it here okay cool now let's see what we can do with this okay so let's let's try this all right so since we're in TMP and we can read and write here I'm going to follow the uh, the guidelines here but I'm going to do it in a slightly different way okay so I'm going to touch a file I'm going to create a file called mol.service okay now I'm going to edit this, edit this file okay and I'm going to copy here all right so all right I'm going to copy all this thing here and I'm going to paste it right here okay cool so we have service it's type one shot we're going to modify the exec start bit here to fit our needs to get a root shell in the system okay now for the time being let's save it let's read it okay good so we've created um, this file here okay that it tries to mimic a service that's why we called it mol.service okay it's malicious mol is for malicious because it's for demonstrative reasons to uh, show that we can actually um, compromise the machine with this SUID that is set here so what we actually going to do here is to create a fake service okay and place a command here in service that will give us uh, a root access and then abuse the system CTL uh, binary all right to launch this malicious service that will give us access to the machine okay so we're going to see how we can abuse it in a while let's take a short break and we'll be right back all right, we're back. Let's see how we can exploit this malicious service to uh, launch our attack. So right here, what we can do is to edit our mall service, malicious service, and change it right here, okay? So what we'll actually do here is try and copy the bin bash of the user that executes the shell, make a copy in the TMP folder and change it as executable. Okay, so since systemctl runs as the root user, we'll, we'll want to copy the bin bash as the root user transfer it to the TMP directory 
and that way we can have a root level TMP bash shell. So let's save it here. Okay, now um, let's see what we also need to do here. Okay, I'm sorry I, I, I paused the video again. Okay, now we'll need to link, all right, so let's say bin system CDL. Uh, let's go here, link mole.service. Okay, it says invalid argument. So probably we have done something that uh, is not so. All right, let's try and define the absolute path here. Okay, uh, we needed to uh, specify the absolute path for our malicious service. Okay, so we've created a symlink. Okay, and the next step is to enable now this service. So let's try to enable this service. Okay. So let's try and do this. Okay, uh, now something, all right, let's see again, now, all right, let's see if we can, all right, let's try it one more time. All right, we're getting an error. We'll, we're going to have to research it a bit and see if we can fix it. Let's probably something is wrong in here. Let's add some spaces here just in case. Let's make sure that this is accurate. All right, perhaps some quotations are missing. Um, let's Let's find out and uh, I'll get right back to you. Okay, we're back. After some research, we found out uh, what's wrong. It seems that our command was uh, wrong. There were some quotations missing. So uh, let's see what we have done here. We have created another malicious service file. Let's check it out. So it's as we mentioned, it's a service with the one-shot type, but this time we're going to use the bin sh uh, to execute a command to change the and set the suid in bin bash. Okay. Now, as we mentioned before, since uh, system CDL has the suid enabled, then whatever it runs is being run with root access. So what will actually happen here is that it will use this one with root access to change the bin bash and set the SUID here. So this will allow us to gain root access to the machine. Now let's try to link this service, system CDL link malicious service. Uh, okay, yeah, invalid argument. We forgot to specify the absolute path here. Great. And we have to enable it. Okay, it has successfully been enabled and Right now, if we check it, okay, we can see that Bimpash has the SUID set right here, okay? That's great. So if we type Bimpash-P, then we root. So 
right here we have managed to gain root access. Of course, we could abuse this um, misconfiguration to gain a reverse shell, but since we're in this machine, uh, we won't have a problem in escalating our privileges right here without the need to uh, gain another reverse shell and do our things from there. Uh, so that was a rather simple privilege escalation technique, okay? Um, Limpies picked this up pretty easily. Of course, um, the syntax here, okay, you might need some experimentation uh, to, to get the exploit to work, uh, but, uh, you know, you can always follow the, uh, um, you know, the walkthrough here, and uh, we can see that actually there are various ways, like the one we used, but other people, you know, they have just um, used the same command to, uh, you know, change the bin bash file, but, uh, you know, other people have simply uh, chosen to read the root flag, all right, and submit it to uh, try hack me, uh, like this, or make a copy um, of the file. Uh, you can do pretty much everything you want, okay, um, because you know, as UIDs set uh, that are set in some binaries, they can be exploited pretty heavily, so they can give you pretty much full access to the machine. Uh, so we are already root here, but let's see if we can also launch. Okay, let's see if we can also launch something like a kernel exploit. So let's. See here, well, it says that the target is vulnerable to punk it, so why not try to use it, all right? So let's use this. So options, let's set our L host right. Let's set our L port to four sixes, set session to five i think that's where our session id was all right let's try to exploit that okay let's see if that will work okay it also appears to be vulnerable to the uh, to this one and this one we can try them as well but we can see that it's working okay so it has sent a stage if you see that sending stage here it's a pretty good sign that you will gain the much desired interpreter session you want okay so let's see get uid and we are root okay so the intended way to exploit this box and escalate your privileges or was um, through the exploitation of the system CDL SUID misconfiguration. Okay, but we can also see that this target was vulnerable to the Punkit LP PK exec exploit. Um, that's something you will encounter in uh, CDFs. I mean, uh, when boxes come out, all right, they are are probably patched, okay, and they're vulnerable to just the intended route, but as uh, time passes, new kernel exploits or other exploits might come out, so you will probably find more ways of either gaining access or escalating your privileges, okay? So right here, we can see that we now have two sessions. The first is with our original, at www.dataUser and the other one is with root access. Now we can uh, search here for persistence modules, okay? And uh, of course we, we want to look for Linux uh, modules, okay? And this time let's try and use this. So we'll use two. Let's see the options we have. Let's set 
session to six. Let's set our L host to our try hack me VPN address and let's set our L port to a higher number this time. So if we run this, okay, so it has created an auto start file here. Okay, and if we go here, we can see if that exists and it exists. So what this has actually done is to upload an auto start file which will allow us to gain persistence in this uh, machine. So each time it boots up, all right, we will have access to that machine and we can see some more information about this, okay? So it says here, this module will create an auto start entry to execute a payload. The payload will be executed when the user log in. Okay, so this one is a great module if you want to gain persistence. Okay, so uh, you're in a real life engagement uh, on a, I don't know, 10 or five day schedule, you'll want to have persistent access to the machines that you've compromised. You don't want to get all over again and try to compromise the machine. Uh, so some post exploitation is also great and you can search for post exploitation modules here there are tons of it or you can even write your own to meet your needs so this is it um, thanks for watching it was an interesting box it had um, an interesting way of gaining access mostly due to the need to fuzz the file extensions but it also um, had two interesting ways of escalating our privileges to this machine and uh, as you can see we did it directly from the www.datauser uh, or service better call it the service user uh, to root access without the need to um, uh, to do lateral privilege escalation to either two of the users so thanks very much and hopefully I'll get back to you with more video walkthroughs.